Good evening. How is everyone? Great. My name is Matthew Camp. I'm Director of Government Relations and Community Engagement at Teachers College and also a proud TC alum. Thanks for coming. Um, this is the first time we've been here in three years and it was not easy. Um, did anybody try to fly in today? Uh, I, I did. It didn't, didn't, it didn't work out. Took the train. Um, so really glad everyone's showing up here. Um, there were definitely a lot of moving pieces to put this together. We uh, had uh, Jessica Kardashian Char send her regrets. She um, finished her last day at the U.S. Department of Ed on Friday and is now working in education policy at the Senate Education Committee. So we'll hope to get her back into the fold shortly. Um, so she's an alum, I'm an alum, who else is an alum? Nice, how about students? Students, AKA future alums, okay. Friends of the college, thank you for coming. Uh, thank you for being here. Um, to keep the students motivated to push through and to become an alum, I'm gonna share a couple of the benefits of being an alum, besides that diploma on your wall. Um, so you do get Google for life, you get to uh, have the tc.edu uh, address, and it's a great way of staying in touch, and you'll be getting a couple emails from me, but I promise they'll all be good. Um, if you're on campus, you get access to guest housing, you get access to the fitness center, and access to the Columbia Library, which is not small. Uh, to help your career, no matter where you are around the world, uh, you'll have access to TC Next, our career services office, uh, continuing education, and events and networking such as this. So on the events and networking front, uh, we will, it will be driven by you, the alum. So has anybody worked or had any inter uh, experience in politics? A couple people, yeah, grassroots kind of organizing. So we do wanna take a grassroots perspective and do our job listening to your needs and your desires and hopes and dreams and help match make and uh, support you. So. Um, a couple ways of doing that. On <coughs> uh, the end of the month, on uh, January 31st actually, we'll be having a TC Take Action Coalition get together. Um, there's a QR code back of the room, please sign up. And TC Take Action is a great way to stay on top of the issues of the day. Um, we're advocating for um, all kinds of issues around racial justice, LGBTQ rights, um, climate, uh, and on the 31st, it's around API, Asian American Pacific Islander legislation in New York State. Uh, there's a bill that would uh, support API curriculum, um, and actually we'll have the bill sponsor, Senator John Liu, join us on Zoom. So it's a great way to learn about that and to take action. Um, there'll be other TC Take Action events almost every month throughout the semester, so stay tuned. On March 29th, another day for your calendar, is uh, TC Impact Day. And TC Impact Day is when alumni throughout the country will get together to support a local project. So it's a great way to have an impact in your community. Another way of getting involved is as an alumni volunteer. And so you were greeted by uh, Nadia Ford and, uh, as you signed in. Thank you, Nadia, for uh, being an alumni leader here in Washington. And so you could do the same in your communities uh, once you graduate. And again, say, hey, Matt, you know, we want to have a happy hour or um, invite a policymaker um, to come meet with us and we'll be happy to uh, help support that. So <clears throat> lots of great ways. I also want to encourage you to reach out to me. My colleague, Linda Calhoun, in the back of the room, hi, Linda, um, is um, <clears throat> head of TC Experience and we're all here to, to help. I also want to introduce um, our next uh, person on the panel, which is, uh, who is the Virginia and Leonard Marks Professor of Early Childhood and Family uh, Policy, co-director of the National Center for Children and Families at TC, adjunct at Yale University's Child Study Center. And she has helped shape early childhood practice and policies in the United States and countries throughout the world. <clears throat> uh, she's author of an astonishing 225 articles and 13 books her research focuses on institutions that impact child and family life. She works to improve the design and quality of early childhood practices and policies by consulting with the White House, with federal and state agencies, 
elected and appointed policymakers, including governors, members of Congress, and legislatures, and foundations and corporations. And uh, it's my honor to introduce Lynn Kagan, Professor Lynn Kagan. Thank you. So most of you guys just know me as Lynn and don't know all that stuff, so just, you know. <laughs> um, Matt, thanks for that kind introduction. And thanks to you and all for bringing us all together as people who love and revere TC. Um, tonight I've really got two jobs. My first job is to do introductions, and my second job, like any professor, is to do ex explanations. So by way of introduction, um, we're here, not just because we're alums and we love you, but we're also here because many of us have spent a week in Washington as part of the Federal Policy Institute, and I'm anxious to introduce you to that, and more importantly, to the FPIers, those who've been involved. A couple of comments are in order. Um, FPI has a lot of goals, and many of its goals are very similar to all of its sister courses in policy at TC, you know, to understand conceptualizations of the policy process, to understand different political theories related to policy, contemporary policy themes, but FPI is also stunningly different. Um, it's designed to be a hands-on and hearts-in experience. It's designed to put theories to the test of reality. It's designed to hone policy skills, that is, synthesizing information, in this week's case, from over 30 different speakers with very different perspectives. It's designed to help us all speak and think clearly and succinctly and precisely, to enunciate our stances with clarity and with vigor, to think critically, and actually to discern the fluff, the intellectual fluff from the chat, right? Okay. Um, FPI is different. It's really, really quirky. Half of it takes place at TC. Half of it takes place in DC. Half of it is in the first semester. Half of it is in the second semester. Half of it is theoretical. Half of it is applied. Half of the students are policy students, and the other half come from a myriad of departments within our wonderful institution. By design and by selection, FPIers are eclectic. They have very, very different backgrounds and very different experiences, although this year I can tell you that the majority of our FPIers have all either are or have been classroom teachers, something that we are all very delighted about. We learn from our differences, we question each other, we press each other, and indeed, I think FPI is actually designed to raise far more questions than it is to answer any of them. Some of them are silly questions. Some of them are really provocative questions. Some of them are heart-wrenching, like what is the purpose of education? And who am I? And what do I want to be? What do I want for my professional life? That's the intentionality of FPI. To provoke these questions, and I use that verb advisedly, FPIers interact with the key leaders, educational leaders in our country. And they are asked to ask theoretical questions no holes barred questions, brilliant questions, we hope, and this year's group has indeed lived up to that expectation. Some of the questions they've asked are what's really great about what you do and what's really not so great about what, really do, what you really end up doing. Will there ever be an end to the gridlock that you are facing and that we are facing? Indeed, Will educational policy ever be immobilized and brought to currency and actually not be subjugated to policy making via regulation as opposed to policy making via legislation? We listen to a lot of different people. 
and I want to share some of our learnings. We learned that there are four or maybe five P's to policy. We learned that the budget process is really actually fun and complex. <laughs> We learned about four corners. I know that's not a place in the middle of the country. It actually is about the four policy corners. We learned that, indeed, there is a distinction between bipartisanship, that is, when two parties reach a compromise, and transpartisanship, that is, when parties all agree, but for very different reasons. We learn to understand what it means to be a radical pragmatist and how sometimes, actually pretty often, you have to change the verbiage to get your point across. The weaponization of equity, or today at a very interesting session at the Heritage Institute, we learned about debt amnesty, which is another word for loan <laughs> forgiveness. We did. We did. Um, immediately before this session, uh, I asked the students to reflect on their three days. Students, uh, there was a purpose for my asking that, aside from wanting to hear what you said. But here's a little bit about what they said thus far, and we're only three days into it. Um, they learned about the importance of networking, of networking in this city, and of networking as actually a social reality. We learned about the importance and the potency of local activism, particularly when federal policy indeed may be somewhat stagnated. We learned about how society shapes education and how education shapes society. We learned about philanthropy and trends in philanthropy and some good do's and some good don'ts. We saw the changing nature of accountability, how that has happened over time, and the way people are thinking about it right now. There were a cacophony of very different voices, and our FPIers are really challenged to put this complex policy puzzle together. We're not done yet, but we are well on our way. And I would like you to hear from the voices of the FPIers themselves. So will the 2023 FPIers please stand up and come forward. All right. Okay, now there is no free lunch. We learned that, right? So the no free lunch is I'm going to give you a warning. You each get one word to describe your FPI experience this week and be frank. Errol, since you always stand in the back, you get to start. Go. <laughs> no, just one word from where you are. Just shout it out and then write down the line really quickly. We're one word. Thank you. All right. Really. <laughs> one word. One word. All right. Clarifying. Clarifying. One word. Eye opening. Practical. You can say it, but somebody else said it. Profound. Choices. Authentic. Enlightening. Oh. Challenging. Eye opening. Scary. <laughs> A cacophony. Yeah. Insightful. Life-changing. Legendary. <laughs> Sensational. I say enlightening. Enlightening. Radical. Essential. Diplomatic. Refreshing. Collegial. Whoa. Sorry. Pace. Centering. Complicated. Uh, varied. Confusing. 
Interdisciplinary. So uh, as you can hear, my word would be, my word would be energized and wow, what a group. Um, some of our students have decided that they really love policy and that they indeed may want to work in it. They may, may want to work in Washington. Others have said that this experience is propelling them back to the classroom or to think about completely different alternatives outside outside of education, but um, no matter what, this group represents incredible intellect, incredible energy, and a word that they used, really, really, really incredible hope. I think each and every speaker who has spoken was astonished at the level of the questions, the intellectual acumen, the enthusiasm, and the experience of our students. And I want to tell you as alums, the TC should be, and as a board member, TC should really, really, it should be proud of who we are. It should be proud of what we do. It should be proud that this kind of a quirky course is allowed to exist. And it should be very proud of its over 23 year relationship with the Institute for educational leadership. I want, <laughs> we are very, very, very well represented by our partners from IEL and I'm going to ask them all to stand. Come on guys, stand up. <laughs> Eddie, Helen, <laughs> Michelle, great, great, great. And we sing our praises to you, and our hearts are eternally, eternally grateful for all the work you did to make this possible. There are two other individuals who I definitely know that we all want to acknowledge, and they are sitting over there. Hannah Junis and Trevor Basin, would you please stand up? <laughs> They're the ones who make this all tick, and you can tell everybody knows it. Um, I just want to say that I feel so privileged to be able to teach this course. Those of you who are returning as former FPIers, can you raise your hand? Great. You know that. You know that there's no greater joy that a faculty member can ever experience than the joy of watching their students go forward and really help change the world. So I am indebted to you. And I am indebted to Jay Irwitz, who it is my pleasure to introduce right now. Jay is going to be our guide for the rest of the evening. But there's something more important you need to know. This is not a new role for Jay. He has been public policy's TC guide since the word policy was ever on the agenda in our administration and with our Board of Trustees. He is the reason we are here. He is the reason why students of decades past have been able to have a policy experience. He is our advocate for this with the trustees and with the administration. And Jay, you need to know that we are ever, ever, ever indebted to you always. You are always first and foremost our hero. And you know, there is a reason. Um, Jay has passion. He has heart, he has intelligence, and he has integrity. He's been an ardent supporter of virtually everything we do that is policy related. He comes to this with a very, very rich background. And you will see the reasons why our histories actually prepare us for the roles we take on. Jay is currently a senior fellow at the American Council on Education which is an umbrella group for higher ed in Washington, but that does not tell anywhere near the story. Prior to that, 
He was Deputy General Counsel in the United States Department of Education for the Obama administration. And there he handled a vast array of issues dealing with everything from accountability, compliance, and higher ed policy. He indeed worked with a large number of nonprofit and for-profit institutions. He was a partner for 30 years in a major law firm of Wilmer Hale, and he specialized in issues facing universities and educational businesses. He was a legislative assistant for the Domestic Policy Council for Senator Edward Kennedy. He received a Master of Public Policy from the Kennedy School of Government, and he also received his law degree, and he has been an ardent supporter from Harvard, I will say that, <laughs> as a Yale, um, and he, but he has been an ardent, ardent supporter of what is right and what is just before these were actual buzzwords. It's earmarked in every single thing he does and in every breath he breathes. It's a real honor, a real honor, and with heartfelt appreciation, Jay, that I welcome you. I appreciate it. Well, it's that's true. terrific. It's totally true. It's totally true. Uh, as uh, Lynn didn't tell you, uh, she told you that I had been around since policy was introduced at TC. I've been around, as you can tell, since the word was invented. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, Lynn, as you know, is not only a fabulous professor, uh, but is also the wellspring for uh, so much of what has been done in Washington in early childhood education and care, and family policy. Uh, when I worked for Senator Kennedy and when I worked in the Obama administration, the first question anybody would ask uh, in Washington uh, about anything having to do with family policy or early childhood education was, what does Lynn Kagan think? And they would ask me if I happened to be proposing something, or otherwise they would just call and, and then you knew it was either a thumbs up or a thumbs down. Uh, and it didn't matter what I had to say. It only mattered what Lynn had to say, uh, which of course made those of us who were not Lynn uh, just a trifle jealous. Uh, I uh, want to uh, tell you uh, before I introduce the, the terrific people who are gonna be uh, who are going to be the main speakers today, um, what um, is going on at TC. We have 1,700 new students this fall. Uh, well, this, it's already past the fall. Uh, 1,700 new students, 3,000 returning students from 54 countries, 48 states. Half, more than half, identify as students of color, 24% our first generation. Second, from TC's own pockets, we're proud that we've given over $30 million in financial aid. This is different from the money that Jordan gives out now uh, as a representative of the federal government because this is money which uh, comes from other than public pockets. Uh, and that doesn't, so it doesn't include the work study money, loans, Pell Grants. The college has now just started its first inaugural diversity, and first inaugural uh, probably mean the same thing, but uh, uh, our, <laughs> our inaugural diversity, equity, and inclusion report, and two-thirds of our new nine tenured and tenured track faculty members are people from diverse racial and ethnic backgrounds. And then finally, something that uh, when, we, when he does return home, we will welcome uh, Professor Matsudera back with is we have strengthened our research funding. It's up 22%, 22% uh, in, uh, from fiscal year 22 over 21. That includes, that's therefore a total of $49 million in grants and contracts. And that's not only good because it shows how very much people are desirous of 
or the, the assistance and the thoughts of TC faculty. It's also terrific because it provides such great opportunities for internships uh, and for assistantships uh, for uh, students at, at TC. Um, so um, I now want to introduce the people who are going to be talking to you about uh, the, uh, about education and the future of education. The first who I know personally is Jordan Mazzadera, who is now the Chief Economist and Deputy Undersecretary at the Department of Education, uh, the first ever Chief Economist uh, in uh, the department uh, and at no better time. Uh, I could make a very credible case that Jordan is the singular article, the most important person in education in the United States today, period, full stop. Now I'll tell you the reasons for that. That's the headline. <laughs> now here comes the paragraph where I say, here are the reasons. We are doing, or the federal government is doing a massive amount of work with respect to the cost of higher education. They're doing it with what you saw yesterday and I pr presumably talked about, income-driven repayment, public service loan forgiveness, um, the gainful employment requirements with respect to for-profit colleges, the uh, way in which um, the uh, loan forgiveness was tailored to provide a much bigger bump for those people who had had Pell Grants, which makes it hugely more equitable than it otherwise would have been. All of these things have been framed by Professor Mazzadera. All of those huge expenditures, those, that huge assistance, the kinds of issues that are gonna remake higher education, and the kinds of things we have at TC, and I don't know if you've participated in the webinars, but we have now have had a couple of webinars at TC talking about public service loan forgiveness and income-driven repayment because of the huge impact that that's going to have on graduates who graduate into a profession which, as you know, has been vastly underpaid. That whole change in the gestalt of what, what your economic future is going to be like if you choose a profession which has help as compared to remuneration as its key concern has been changed in large part because of the way in which these ideas have been framed by Professor Matsudera. Now, in order to ask questions and make comments himself of Professor Matsudera, we have Dr. Basil Smeichel. Dr. Smeichel, who I must admit before this evening I haven't known, is a distinguished lecturer and director of the Public Policy Program and the Roosevelt House Institute for Public Policy at Hunter College. Most importantly, he got his doctorate in politics and education uh, at TC. And he is there, and he is, as you will see, a model of what we hope, at least intellectually, you will all be like <laughs> in, the, in, in the years to come. Well, you know, I didn't want to go overboard. Uh, 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 in the years to come. So it's a great pleasure to introduce two outstanding, not only educators, uh, but uh, analysts uh, to talk about the future of education uh, and uh, the future of federal policy. So, uh, uh, Dr. Matsudera, Dr. Smeichel, it's all yours. Thank you.
Good evening, everybody. I'm going to do that one more time. Good evening, everybody. Uh, that's what I'm talking about. Um, I'm from the Bronx, so I need you to... Yeah, okay. Um, first of all, uh, prof prof Professor Kagan, um, uh, thank you so much. Matthew, thank you so much for, uh, for inviting me today. Um, Jay, thank you so much for your introduction. Um, I have a couple of quick things that I want to say before we get into our questions. First, I saw a lot of folks with some, or a few folks with some D9 paraphernalia. Did I see that? Some Deltas, some AKs in the audience. Um, to my uh, brothers and sisters in, uh, in the D9 who are celebrating anniversaries, I'm a, a 1906 brother. Uh, but for those that are, what's up, Ed? For those that are celebrating anniversaries, for all the work that you do in the community and in, in pursuit of educational excellence, um, happy anniversary, because a few of you are celebrating um, anniversaries in the next couple of days. Um, I also wanted to shout out my cuz. Where are you, cuz? Um, Danette Smichael is here. She is a police officer in the city of Annapolis, Maryland, and she is here. She is here with Vanessa Bright, sitting right next to her, and I want to say Vanessa is uh, with the Maryland Reentry uh, Resource Center. They both are involved in uh, prisoner reentry and in trying to steer young men and women, particularly young men that look like me, away from prison and toward more uh, productive endeavors, particularly in education. So thank you for the work that you do. Good to see you, Coach. <laughs> and some of my students from 4000 Education and Public Policy. Hey, y'all. Um, I hope it was a good class. We tried to mix some of the scholarship and some of the real talk, right, in the course. And for those who have yet to take that class, it's a, a, a shameful plug for my course. Uh, EDPS 4000. EDPS 4000. I'll say it again. Um, Jordan, good to see you. I am a big fan of um, the actor studio, for those that know the actor studio, James Lipton. So I'm going to kind of start where he starts from the beginning. Where are you from? Um, I, I feel the need to back up and just dial the temperature down a no, little no, bit no, after no, that, no. that, that I, introduction is... from Jay. I, I, um, I felt two things really acutely. One is that I wish my mother was here to hear. hear that. Yeah, right. right. You, you, you talk right. about me that way, and and, um, and and I was also regretting my choice to take my tie off before I came. I over will take there. my tie off. I will take um, my tie off. I'm happy to take my tie off. I got dressed up for you, brother. I, you know. Um, but no, uh, that, that was over the top. I'm going to do uh, all I can over the next uh, uh, little bit of time here to, to bring down your opinion of me after that, <laughs> uh, after that introduction from Jay. But um, I, I wanted to say, say first thank you for the introduction and also um, uh, just to Lynn and all the, uh, all the students here. Um, there's, there's no way to make somebody miss home like, uh, like being exactly. in front of all the energy right. from the students like this. Right. And, uh, I really appreciate the invitation to be able to come here and talk with you all tonight. Um, Ithaca, New York. Uh, I was. Uh, oh wow! <laughs> <laughs> I uh, born in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Uh, my family um, moved. My dad was a social worker, um, and we we moved to Ithaca, New York, um, right outside a small town called Dryden. I know uh, Dryden, yeah. Uh, right outside of Ithaca, so Ithaca was the big city for me growing up, um, and I grew up there uh, pretty much from two to twenty-two. Um, and thinking about education in all this time, how did you get inspired to, to do the work that you do? Yeah, so I, I would not say my path was direct. My mother was a school teacher. My yeah. mom taught uh, middle school um, uh, from the time that I was about six or seven years old um, uh, throughout the rest of my life. So she, she's been around teaching. My dad's been around social work um, and had a just kind of strong orientation towards um, being in the public sector uh, as a result of all that. But um, you know, uh, as I made my way through, thought about uh, a lot of different paths and ended up going into academia to do research uh, on a lot of these issues, had always been drawn to policy, uh, and then through a few twists and turns just came to, to work in uh, environments like this. My mother was a school teacher. She taught special ed for 30 years. Did she make you do work before you went outside to play? <laughs> <laughs> 
Was it that was it that tough? Was it like school at school and school at home? Uh, a little bit, a little yeah. bit. So my, my mother um, was a was a health teacher, uh, and so uh, would embarrass me with with yeah. sex ed videos from, a, from a, <laughs> an early. Uh, feel like I'm I'm oversharing already. It's I haven't. All right. it's um, all right. I, I haven't been uh, been trained in the ways of uh, of DC sure. enough to to prevent myself from saying things like that. But uh, no, she um, she uh, she uh, she worked the next town over, so I, I was usually um, uh, by myself and had a few hours to play with friends after school before she got home. Nice. But but then when she did, uh, there, there was a fair amount of that. And all the work that you've done, what, you know, now that uh, now that we have a, you may have some opportunity to reflect. What are some of the th biggest challenges um, that you see in American education today? And I imagine that some of that is not just your academic experience, professional experience, but maybe some of your inspiration growing up. Um, yeah, thanks. I mean, so maybe to back up also to, to kind of where I'm coming from in the, in the vantage point that I'm in now. So as, as Jay was saying, I work in the, in the office of the undersecretary as, as the deputy undersecretary and chief economist. The undersecretary's office is the office that's in charge of developing higher education policy, running higher education policy in the department. So. Um, you may have may have heard that we're up to a few things um, these days, but um, you know a lot, a lot of the things that that keep me up at night is trying to think about uh, how to help college be that um, be that um, springboard that helps uh, people uh, advance their lives, helps promote mobility. Um, you know the challenges that we see are you, you know we're doing a pretty good job of getting people into college these days. Um, like lo lots of students are are getting in the doors of college, but too few of them are getting through uh, and getting out on the backside. Mm -hmm. um, you know when we look across socioeconomic statuses these days, the gaps in college completion after people get there are even bigger than the gaps in attending college. Yep. Um, and it feels like we're just, you know, kind of leaving a lot of human potential on the table, right? Like colleges are getting a chance to touch people's lives, but they're not successfully getting them um, to the end, getting them to that degree that's really going to help improve um, their lives on the back end. So, so thinking a lot about how we use the tools that we have available, um, you know, the, the resources that we can give to colleges directly for them to be helpful, the resources that we can give to the students to help ease the way um, for them to make it through college. Um, thinking about refining all those tools in a way that really helps, you know, once all these people are getting to college, gets them through uh, and, and into successful careers on the back end. Those, those are the things that I spend most of my time thinking about. I ask that in part, too, because, you know, I do a lot of work with my old high school. I work with a lot of high school kids. And one of the biggest questions they have for me is, should I go to college? Is it worth it? And they are looking, they're asking that question in part because of the economics of it. You know, how do we... How do we talk to those students about the importance of going to college, but being mindful that, particularly if they're coming from disadvantaged backgrounds, the, the economics of it is pretty prohibitive, is somewhat prohibitive. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, I mean, one, one of the big things the administration ha has worked on is really trying to address affordability, right? So to make, make that a less scary choice to get there. But, it, but again, like a lot of people have been getting there. It's just when they get there and they keep getting tuition bills and so on, like too many people are getting discouraged and in, 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 um, in ending up getting, getting out. A lot of people are also scared of the consequences of borrowing to keep financing their education, right? Like a lot of states have been drawing back their support from education. That's leaving a lot of community college students, a lot of, school, a lot of students who are going to, to public colleges to have to pay more of the tuition on their own. They're having to borrow to do that. Um, the consequences of borrowing, they can see all around them, you know, family, friends, and so on, who, who you know, whether they, they got through school and are trying to, to pay off their debt, whether, whether they might have dropped out early and, and didn't get the earnings bump that we hope people get when they go to college um, and are stuck in that situation. You see that having, a lot, that, that, the lack of that earnings bump. Absolutely. I mean, I, I think something that, that is surprising to a lot of people who haven't worked in this space is that, um, you know, there are 45 million people with, with a student loan right now in the country. Uh, about a third of them don't have a degree, right? They went to college but did not make it through the mm. other end to get a degree. Mm. And for them, you know, the, the promise of college really boosting their earnings, like getting them into the, to the middle class and beyond just hasn't paid off. Um, so, so they're there trying to pay off um, um, all this debt without like really having the, the higher resources to be able to do that. So again, I mean, that, that's um, a lot of the motivation behind a lot of the policy 
action, a lot of thinking that you've seen uh, out of the department, out of the administration. And I imagine COVID had something to do with that, right? Uh, I mean, it was, it was a contributing factor, not just in terms of finishing, but also the, the kinds of jobs and the income that students make it afterwards. We definitely saw uh, a lot of people's educations disrupted during that time. So, um, you know, it's kind of exacerbated a, a trend that we've seen um, recently where, you know, especially for lower income students, students who are in community colleges, um, um, students of color, you've seen a kind of a downward trend that's been happening over the last 10 years. You know, s some of that is people being uh, kind of tempted to, to kind of stay in the labor market because mm -hmm. the labor market's been improving over that time period. But um, but for a lot of folks, it's just it's just the cost of things. And then the pandemic absolutely did not uh, yeah. did not help. So you know some of that was was actually on the college side of things, right? Like um, you know it's hard to continue to teach a welding program or a nursing program while mm -hmm. everybody's remote uh, and to continue offering all these classes. So so some of those things you know are going to go away, right? Like a, as time continues to work through. But now we've got backlogs. Um, institutions don't have the resources to expand um, the slots that they offer, like uh, at a time to kind of fulfill. Um, to kind of bring in all the people whose whose careers, whose education might have been delayed, um, so there, there's a lot of those kinds of problems, those kind of bottlenecks to solve in, right. in a lot of students to try to make sure they get back in, and we don't have a generation who, um, you know, lost years of education because of the pandemic. Now, I, I'm a politics and ed guy, and you touched on it. Maybe you didn't, but I'm just asking it anyway. Um, as we think about the politics of education, which for some Maybe, they, maybe there's a sense that you know, politics shouldn't be in education to the extent that it is, but do you feel that so much of your work is political in nature? Um, so there's, there's no question. I mean, uh -huh. um, you know, the, the temperature is really dialed up right yeah. now. I, I, I think it's hard to find common ground. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, for, for me and the work that I do, um, you know, we have our head down most of the days just trying to, to, um, to think about. Is that difficult to sort of tune, are, are you trying to tune everything out day to day? Yeah, I mean, we, we have a lot of work to do. So we, we, have, a, we have a big regulatory agenda in yeah. front of us that, that doesn't depend on, you know, the machinations of Congress and getting things through. But there's, there, there's no It does question. not depend on that. Right, right. Yeah. So, you know, the, these are things that we're working through on, on the executive branch. So the, the redesign of student loan repayment systems, um, the accountability issues, some, some things that Jay worked on in the past that we continue to try to, to, to reintroduce and improve on, on what we did during the Obama years. Yeah. Um, all of those things are, are things that um, th there is a lot that we can do to, to help improve the lives of students, and we're, we're really focused on getting those things done. And without having to deal with sort of the Transitions, because I mean, this is that's an important question as we think about um, co consistent education policy. You also have to deal with changes in administrations, not just nationally, but also at the state and local level, right? Yeah, no, no question. I mean, there, there's definitely been a cycle of that. So, you know, I was involved in a lot of these policies from the White House side um, uh, in the Obama administration. We saw some of those efforts rolled back, and now we're uh, we're trying to put some of those um, those protections for students and taxpayers back in place, um, mm. but there's no question that's a challenge. Yeah, and when it, we've heard, we're, we're we're seeing, and you're a higher ed guy, you know, we're we're watching what's happening at the Supreme Court with affirmative action. Uh, I read something the other day that the governor of Florida. Um, has asked uh, colleges and universities in that state to report to him uh, how much money they're spending in diversity. Do you see a chilling effect um, for that kind of diversity work or equity work in higher ed because of the politics of the day? Yeah, so I'm, I'm, uh, I, I would ask you all who are, you know, I think that ch the chilling effect is probably felt by a, a lot of the institutions who are in states like this where, where an administration might not be friendly to these efforts. I mean, um, we, you know, we are, we are certainly trying to promote efforts like this um, in the department. We're, we're doing a lot of work to try to give um, institutions and the public students who are really trying to uh, organize around promoting these, these, you know, diversifying the faculty. Uh, other kinds of issues to really bring different perspectives onto campus. Like we're, we're doing what we can to really try to promote those efforts um, from the department. Um, 
but um, but but you see that. I mean, I, I think from the from the federal perspective, um, you know, I, I think we're we're really trying to support like the diversification. I mean, I think we we all uh, kind of agree that that learning happens best when different mm. uh, perspectives are represented on campus. There there's like an endless amount of economic research, other research about just how important it is for people to see themselves and their mentors and the people who are teaching them and students thrive and and have better outcomes in general. You know, like but back to what I was saying about like how do we make sure that people uh, get through the door you know there are studies about you know just the impact that having a teacher of the same race or identity as, as right. a student like helps the success of those students so so I mean th these are are issues that have tremendous importance for for the economy for our society for for broader equity and so on um, so uh, so yeah I, I think efforts like this the weaponization of equity as, as, as Lynn was saying uh, are really troubling, um, and um, and uh, and we're trying to be resources for for institutions to help uh, help where we can. So on that note, do we what 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 drives you? What what are you so optimistic about? You get up in the morning and say, "Man, I can't wait to work on this," because we're all you know we 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 see a lot, we experience a lot in the in the, all of the work that we do. Um, most of it is encouraging and uh, inspiring. Um, but you know, we also have days where not so much. Uh, but for for where we where you are, particularly from the vantage point that you've had in D.C., and people could have their opinions about what happens in this place, right? What what what's driving you every day? What what are you optimistic about? You go into the office, and man, I I can't wait to do this work. Um, yeah. So uh, there are a couple of things. So I, I'll start. Um, start with with the broad um, kind of thing, and then and then talk about some particulars. Um, you know, at, at a point in time, there are about maybe 25 million people who touch college campuses. Mm -hmm. Students, students who are you know again trying to go to college, improve their lives, improve their improve their their labor market prospects, get the kind of job that they want. Um, you know, refine their skills in, in a craft and so on. Uh, about half of them, like you know, differences across sectors, but about half of them don't get to the finish line, and, and a lot of that has to do with with the structure of the way that we finance education and like just the the realities of life happening for people and people not being able to get through. Um, the thing that the Department of Education has the most influence over is is just exactly that, like how we how we finance higher education, and I think we're at a we're at a moment where there's a really broad and holistic rethinking of how we finance higher education um, you know in a way that really helps promote equity instead of reinforcing a lot of the structural inequities um, that, that kind of that tend to perpetuate inequalities across um, different places so you know the scale of this endeavor you know the alternative use of my time is is being back in my office in New York which I love um, you know having having coffee with Lynn and so on but um, uh, I, I miss that a lot, but the chance to, um, you know, make tweaks that, you know, change that 50% of people who don't make it to 45%, that, that's a massive, the millions upon millions of people uh, who, if they get to the college degree, are going to see, you know, we know studies show that lifetime income goes up by more than a million dollars if we get people uh, to that finish line of getting a college degree. Um, it is it is a, a privilege that I take really seriously to be able to to try to um, to move the ball on that. Mm -hmm. So that that that's definitely what what brings me to the office. Um, excited to work uh, every morning. Uh, I, you um, mentioned coffee with Lynn. I won't ask you about <laughs> what you discuss, <laughs> but what I would ask is the relationship between practitioners and scholars and political folks who care about the same thing, want to get to the same place. Um, what's it like sort of working with these diverse voices? Um, and for those in, in, in academia, what role do you see, do, you ha do they have in your day-to-day -day work and vice versa? How do you inform what's happening in the classroom? Yeah, so it, it's a great question. Um, w one of the things that I've been excited about is this. I mean, I would like to know what y'all are talking about, <laughs> but 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 yes. <laughs> um, yeah, I, w one of the the um, the things, just in a more mundane sense, that I've been really trying to do at the department is to create new capacity 
Um, so, so Jay mentioned that, that I was appointed by the secretary as the, the first ever chief economist uh, at the department. R really, the, the capacity that I am trying to build is an ability to bring in outside expertise to be able to use the, the kind of vast administrative data um, that the department sits on top of. In, in higher education, um, the department has helped about 150 million people pursue uh, higher education credential um, since 1972, and we have the stories of all those people, information about what helped them, what hindered them, um, uh, just lying in, you know, reams of databases uh, in inside the department, but, but people have not tried to tell the stories of those people and learn from them. Uh, with the data, so so one of the things that I'm doing in this office is really to bring in outside academic uh, researchers who have the skill to be able to really um, tell those stories um, and learn from them, uh, translate them uh, to department leadership to really help them understand like what what helped different people, what hurt different people's um, progress towards a degree. Um, so. You know, broadly, I would say there's there's far too little interaction between um, uh, academic researchers and policymakers. Um, you know, both of those groups of people are very busy. You know, <laughs> they, they they have different demands on their time. I mean, one one of the things that I think is so great about um, th this program that that Lynn is running is just really trying to bring like academia inside the policy house, and in that I hope is like enriching to both sides. So I. I, I try to do that um, for academic faculty as well, and it, it's kind of, you know, in, in some senses a similar uh, experience, I imagine. Like a lot of outside academics like come inside and have never like tried to explain the results of their research. Like that might suggest that this kind of intervention is really the most important kind of thing to improve student success. Never tried to like explain that to a policy person. <laughs> And that policy person has like no idea like how to interpret the words that are coming to them because <laughs> so, so there's a lot of this kind of translational work that really needs to happen um, in both sides like need to find ways of like having institutions to interact with each other more often um, and, and and that's like a lot of what I've what I've been working on trying to accomplish inside the department is bringing like a creating a permanent institution that plays that role and helps to inform education policy going right. forward. Now, um, we're going to get to um, your questions in a second, but my last question, have you been to the Oval Office? Uh, not recently. Um, but, but you uh, have. Not, not recently. How great is it to say, not uh, recently, but no, I'm going to get back there. <laughs> and so just as in, in, before we go to the audience questions, what's, how did you feel from Dryden, New York, to the Oval Office? It, no, it's surreal. It's surreal. Um, growing up, I didn't imagine I'd have a chance to um, have this kind of impact on people's lives. And um, yeah, it's a privilege, like I said. Thank you, brother. Um, <laughs> happy to take audience questions. OK, if you could speak into the mic for a recording. Thank you. Uh, good evening, professors. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, you mentioned about uh, like a college cost uh, hinder people from going there, and there are some like initiative about uh, early college access, such as like a dual enrollment program or like early middle college. Do you see that kind of as a, a method to solve this problem or as a compromise uh, to help people get to that point? Forgive me, I, I just missed the first part of what you said. I'm so sorry. Oh, uh, uh, like uh, lots of people have problem, uh, financial problem, access, uh, sorry, <laughs> accessing college. So I was wondering whether this uh, dual enrollment program or like a, um, early middle college kind of access program will kind of help that way. Yeah, yeah, no, I, that's a great question, thank you. Um, yeah, I do, I do, and I, I think there have been some studies that really show promise um, for those kinds of initiatives. I, I think a lot of it is, is giving people exposure to a college experience, helping people like believe, like see themselves on a college campus and believe that they can do that. Um, it may be more so than, than um, addressing the cost side of um, the equation. I think those things are just about 
you know, kind of giving people the information, like about, you know, if they go to go to a program like that, they see that there are people like themselves who who are out of college and are able to do things. Um, so, so I definitely think initiatives like that are promising. You know, um, um, one of the things that the department is working on in that vein is really supporting a lot of dual enrollment programs, which which can play a similar role. Uh, I think to that where you know students in high school are taking uh, college credit classes at community colleges usually um, it, And there's a lot of evidence that that does help um, You know first give people a little bit of a head start like when they do get to college and, and that might address the the cost side of the equation too because they might need to take fewer credits once once they've hit the college um, So so yeah, I do I definitely think those are promising Thank you for this discussion um, Quentin Lemkin um, 2011 a TC alum, currently working in DC at the Seed Foundation. I was really intrigued by your comment around how education um, can be refinanced or just the imagination of financing multiple pathways to good jobs. So we'd love to hear you talk a bit more about the future of workforce education and how we can support, um, particularly from the federal level, financing those multiple pathways to good jobs. Thank you. Yeah, great question. Um, yeah, so I, I, I think um, I, I think in, in just in the spirit of, of one of the things that Basil was talking about, I, I, I do think that's an area where there is a lot of bipartisan energy around um, really creating a lot of different pathways to the workforce, including through community colleges. Um, but but generally, one of the big focuses of, of the secretary and in the department has been uh, in really in really focusing on this transition from uh, from high school to the workforce, per potentially through um, different sorts of training programs like this, but but also focusing on um, kind of bolstering career and technical education programs in high schools. Um, so there, there is a, a set of work that that we're kind of undertaking that's all about like re envisioning. Um, um, the way that the transition from like 11th, 12th grade into the first couple of years of college and then into the workforce go together and trying to smooth out some of the transitions there um, to, to make those transitions more natural and in, in, in a little bit um, more streamlined. Um, so, so I think there's a lot of work to be done in that space. Um, thanks for your comments so far. Um, there was a, a survey at a leading US college which asked students, would they rather have the credential um, without the education or the education without the credential? And the vast majority of them picked the credential rather than the education. So my question is, what do you believe is the function of education and how does that belief align with what those survey respondents said? Yeah, I mean, uh, so uh, beyond my current role at the Department of Education, you know, I'm a person who is who has uh, chosen to pursue a path as an educator. So you'd be hard pressed um, to to get me to say that I uh, that I would endorse the notion that you know a degree is just a credential and in, in that um, the the learning that happens in schools is not um, kind of the special sauce that helps uh, make make education more lucrative. Um, you know, so so obviously there, there's a gap there, and and um, I, I'm very curious to see the study. So you have to send it to me. Um, um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, um, I it, it's interesting. I, I do think there are a lot of um, a, a lot of issues around this. There are a lot of uh, kind of scam credentials that that essentially. Um, uh, or, or, or schools that frankly are, are really, um, you know, trying to capitalize on exactly that kind of, of thinking uh, and essentially um, just trying to, to get federal revenues to try to get people in the door to try to give them a credential without um, really uh, taxing too much of their, uh, their time otherwise um, uh, in, in burdening them with the learning that might happen along the way. Um, so, it, you know, I, I think th this is a question that in economics, um, you know, my, my discipline is, is something that uh, goes back for 50 years and people have done, done work on whether, you know, the, the bolster and earnings that you see is really just about like this kind of signaling or um, uh, kind of thing or whether it's really the skill development that's happened. Uh, to people over time, I, I think the evidence is, is like reasonably decisive on 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 the side of the latter. Um, so 
I, I think um, really conveying that that to people, um, conveying to students that uh, you know the, the investment that they put in along the way. I mean, you all have obviously made made similar choices to the ones that I have, so I'm, I'm preaching to the choir, but. Uh, you know, I, I think the, the goals of education are to, you know, imp improve yourself, um, you know, full, um, learn new things, um, actualize the things um, that you want to, to achieve, like with, with the learning that you acquire along the way. Um, so, um, yeah, let, let me leave it there. Back here? Oh, I'll stand. Yeah. Hello. Yeah, this sort of piggybacks off that question from Gareth, but it's this idea of the function of higher education. So it's more of a procedural question on your part, since you're in that econ sphere. Um, when you're thinking about the value that students derive from their higher education, is it solely like in dollar amounts, or do you take like into account the value of, say, the socialization of students when they're in college and having that experience and how they can draw, I guess, a broader value out of that. Like, is that in the equation or how does that work for you? Uh, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I, I, I think, um, yeah, I, I absolutely don't equate the value of college with just the, the financial gain that people get on the back end. Um, so yeah, there's there's the enjoyment that you get, right? The the um, connections that you make, the enjoyment that you have, like the exchange of ideas that that again feeds back into uh, improving yourself, learning from from the people around you. Um, all of that is a critical part of of the value of education, um, and and there are a lot of uh, benefits that an education has that are completely outside of the of, of what shows up in your paycheck on the backside, of course. Um, you know, at, at the same time, you know, I, I think we're also really focused on ensuring that, um, you know, like college is not financially ruinous uh, for people, you know, that, that um, there is some kind of minimum amount of, uh, of um, that, that people who get out on the other side are able to support themselves, um, you know, are not saddled with debt, that they're unable to repay, that ruins their credit, that prevents them from, from doing the kinds of things that they want to do as well. So I, so I tend to think about that kind of financial value equation as something that I want there to be a minimum bar for, um, just, just to kind of protect students from, um, from programs that are going to do harm to, you know, being able to achieve what they want to on the, on the other side. Uh, thank you so much for being here and talking. This is super interesting. Um, we heard earlier today from one of the think tank members about like Arizona's policy. So I'm curious of doing about debt amnesty. <laughs> yes, I, I, no, no, nobody's explained. Yes, <laughs> from the same person um, talking about instead of like per pupil expenditures going to the schools, going to the families on a debit card that they can then take to separate schools. I was kind of interested on your idea of. What that, I know that's kind of K through 12 more than higher ed, but um, what is your kind of idea on the financial like implications of saying, hey parents, here's a debit card of tens of thousands of dollars you choose um, when there is such a lack of understanding of just public education and what truly goes into it. And is there a chance that my financial aid can just be tossed on a debit card and I just choose what school I wanna go to? Like, is there a chance of higher ed ESA cards? You know, it's not so dissimilar from the way we, we do fund higher education, right? The, in, it, it is interesting. I mean, it's kind of a voucherized idea of, of, uh, of financing or subsidizing education for people. And, and that's essentially how we do fund um, or, or subsidize um, low-income students to attend higher education. We give Pell Grants, right? That, so it, and the idea is similar. Um, you know, we, we give students like, you know, it's not, a, it's not on a debit card, but it's basically um, eligibility and entitlement to uh, a grant that's worth about $7,000 and you can redeem it wherever you would like, right? And, um, and what that does is it puts a lot of pressure uh, on the student to make good choices after that. Um, and, um, it, but the money's not tied to the college. I mean, so, so there's obviously public funding for, uh, for community colleges, for college, that, that kind of goes together with that. So, so in higher education, public higher education anyway, is a little bit of a hybrid uh, where there's some 
money that goes to the colleges to keep tuition lower. And then there's also this, this subsidy, which, which in essence functions in the way that you're describing. Um, so, it, and again, I, I think the, you know, the, the, um, the thing that people like about that is, you know, um, um, it, it's been a long time, this kind of a Milton Friedman-esque kind of argument about, you know, just give the students money and let colleges compete for, um, for student enrollment and the competition for students is gonna help like improve quality overall. You know, I, I think the, the evidence is out on whether that really functions in that sort of way. Um, you know, I, th I think you'll find a lot, of, a lot of skeptics of that kind of idea. And, um, and it definitely puts a lot of pressure on, on students and families to really, um, you know, kind of search out, you know, it really puts a lot of pressure on that choice decision. Um, so, you know, I, I think one of the, the directions, and I, I think this conversation that we're having nationally is really thinking about, like, are there better ways of subsidizing um, schools, subsidizing people's education in a way that really ensures that everybody has good choices? Um, and, um, and, and, you know, there's not as much risk in the system. Like if that grant doesn't cover all your tuition and you need to borrow um, uh, at the back end. But it's a, it's a great question. We have time for one quick question and answer. Good evening. My name is Tandra Burkett. My question, well, I had two, but I'll try to narrow it down to one. My question is, beyond the conversation around student loans, how can we increase the focus on the national agenda on education? And my second, if I could get it in, question is, we know that there has been a consistent attack on diversity and inclusion, and how is the administration, what is their messaging to respond? Say a little bit more about what you mean by the first part of the question about about. Well, beyond we have a lot of we've had had a lot of conversation regarding student loans, but education. How do we increase the focus on the national agenda? When we talk about issues in America, there's not a lot of conversation around education. A lot of buzz as it is around you know loans and repaying loans, but what about really the importance of education is really not a thrust happening in the first two years of um, the Biden administration. How do we get that back to the front and what policies are being developed under this administration? And the second one was around what is the response of the, of the administration to the issue, the attack on inclusion and diversity is a, is a major attack happening, but what is the messaging with regard to the response? Yeah, I mean, on the latter, let me take the latter and then come back to the to the first piece. I mean, I, I think on the latter issue, you know, I, I think the administration has been very forward in, in just stressing the importance of um, diversity, equity, inclusion, building a system that works for, for all people and really promoting equity first and foremost. Like in, in my own um, uh, kind of purview, like one of the things that we've really focused on are building new tools. So, you know, the department has pretty limited, um, abil has historically had really limited ability to even track the outcomes of, of students by race. Um, uh, just because it hasn't been part of administrative data collections. That, that recently changed. Congress passed uh, a bill a couple of years ago that gave the department authority for the first time to ask questions about the race uh, of student borrowers. And, and the motivation behind that is 100% about being able to ensure that federal dollars are being used to promote uh, equitable outcomes for all, for all students, but really to be able to focus in on those kinds of questions. In the meantime, I mentioned that we're sitting on top of like data for, for 150 million people who've already been through college. We've been developing new tools to be able to impute race and ethnicity information into, uh, into that data to be able to learn um, um, exactly you know, what I was saying earlier, but to, to bring that kind of racial equity lens to that, to understand what kinds of policies are really promoting the, the success of black and brown borrowers you know, in, in the loan space, not to, not to um, go back to that loan space, but because it's a, a big part of my, my day to day these days. Um, you know, um, um, black undergraduate borrowers, ha half of them uh, experience default um, uh, when they get out of school. That, that, that is not a system that is working for that community. And, uh, and so being able to really study um, uh, what has happened uh, over time and, and what kinds of factors really lie behind the massive disparity that we see where, where black and brown borrowers are, are, are struggling so much with, with debt burdens on the back end uh, and understanding better like what we need to do to change that, um, to, to produce a system that functions more equitably. I mean, 
I think like one of the one of the things around um, debt based finance that that I think we are we are slowly beginning to realize is that that effectively, you know, like if you have a system where you know, a black borrower is defaulting at three times the rate as, as a white borrower would, you know, the, the same, uh, you know, students in exactly the same financial situation, going to the same schools, borrowing the same amount to attend that school, you know, we're essentially charging people different prices um, uh, based on, you know, by, by people's racial background, right? Like, because it's ending up costing that black borrower a lot more, like they're, they're running into late penalties, uh, it's taking them longer to repay. They end up paying more interest as a result of that. So, so the the racial aspects of this and like how we think about it are are really a big part of uh, what what me and the the team are working on um, trying to solve. Um, I, I I think like back to your first question. Yeah, I, I I agree that like a lot of this conversation around around finance has, has kind of dominated the converse, the conversation. You know, I, I think in the department a lot of the tools that we have uh, are centered around those kinds of issues, and and so um, you know like kind of taking a step back and focusing on some of these other uh, issues. I, I don't want to say it's taking a back seat. Um, there are definitely things that I'm a little bit further away from personally, like in my role in the department. Um, but I, but I do think I, I won't go into to depth on, on that question just because I'm a little bit removed from it. But, um, but, um, but, I, but I totally take your point and, and do think it's necessary. And I, I think like some of the issues that we're having are just the contentiousness that that Basil was referring to in the beginning of the national conversation that we're having about education. And I, I think Lynn's phrase is apt about the weaponization of equity, like really standing in the way of of having more productive conversations about uh, how to really serve all our children well. Let's give Basil and Jordan a big hand. Thank you.